All right, everybody. Today we are working on chapter 11, and we're going to be going over uh, transcription of the genetic code, basically biosynthesis of RNA. We're going to take a look at uh, transcription for sure. Um, generally, that's the the goal here is to try to generally get um, some of the highlights. Um, we're going to focus on prokaryotes and we're going to look at how regulation takes place in prokaryotes and if we can make some generalizations into eukaryotes we'll do that but for the most part um, we're going to try to get the big picture painted sort of in the prokaryote realm since it is a simpler model to look at um, and then we will talk about differences and similarities in eukaryotes we'll look at maybe a couple examples of the regulation in eukaryotes we'll talk about non-coding rnas structural motifs in the DNA binding. Um, and uh, actually, I think I put on the on the schedule that I'm going to narrow this chapter down, at least content-wise for the exam, uh, to just being um, sort of 11.1 one, one to 11.3. Um, but I'll, I'll pick and choose a few other little highlights to, um, to, to bring out for this lecture. OK, so transcription is the process by which um, gene products are, are going to be uh, set in motion. So uh, your DNA has um, encoded in it the information for the amino acid sequence, right, for primary structure of our proteins. Um, and so if we have a piece of DNA that codes for a protein, uh, we call that a gene. And then that protein can be enzymatic, that protein can be structural, but anything your body has instructions for are the genes. And so transcription is taking that information and turning it into um, a messenger RNA, which will then, we'll talk about in the next chapter, uh, turn that into a protein. So the mRNA is, of course, the RNA that we're discussing. So it's, that's the RNA that's being synthesized in transcription. Okay. So there are a few things that you absolutely have to have um, to make this happen. You need to have um, enough of each of the nucleotides. Sorry, my pen's dying. You also have to have uh, some magnesium. You don't need a primer like we did uh, with the R uh, DNA polymerase, uh, RNA uh, polymerase can actually just go and start sticking nucleotides together. Uh, the chain does grow the same direction from five prime to three prime. Uh, that means that the strand that's being read is actually the three prime to five prime strand. Um, and we call that the template strand. Let's see here. We're going to look at some diagrams and talk about how um, how exactly the ribosome, I'm sorry, uh, the um, RNA polymerase knows where on the DNA it's supposed to start coding, right, or just supposed to start reading, and which strand it's supposed to start reading it, and so forth. Okay. So RNA polymerase. Uh, similar to that of DNA polymerase, uh, is its job is to grow this new polymer of nucleotides. So um, it's um, about 470,000 Daltons. It comes in multiple subunits. There's the alpha, the, uh, the what is this? I want to call it the omega. Uh, couple beta, beta prime, and the sigma. And the way that it's actually set up is like this in this orientation, two A's, an omega, a beta, beta prime. Uh, they call that the core enzyme. And then when it's paired with that sigma, then it's called the hollow enzyme. And so the hollow enzyme has all the components, the core enzyme does not. Without that hollow enzyme, without that sigma, the core enzyme doesn't know exactly where it's going. A core enzyme, will latch on to DNA and start copying it. And it's, it's random. But the sigma factor is what really kind of tells it where to start going. And so we'll see that that's probably the, the most important, important component of this um, polymerase. 
All right. So there's a lot of names for these things. Uh, the template strand. This is the one that RNA polymerase is going to read. This is the one that's from 3 prime to 5 prime. It's going to go in this direction, making the new um, RNA strand 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay. That is called the antisense or the negative strand. Um, it's, it's called antisense because uh, it's the complement to the mRNA. And the mRNA is often thought of being the thing that actually makes the, um, you know, the mRNA's sequence is actually the one that is the sequence of the amino acids, right? And so that's the sense strand. Um, that hence why the, uh, the other strand here is called the coding strand. And so the coding strand is the one that if you read the DNA of the coding strand, um, from three prime to five prime, it would actually be, it would match the sequence of the mRNA and the sequence of our proteins. Um, that's not how we read DNA though. We don't read the three prime to five prime side. So this is often a source of confusion for students. Okay, so we, we the book often shows the coding strand when it's talking about the sequence of DNA because the coding strand matches the mRNA strand, uh, with the exception of the swapped out uracils and thymines. The template strand, though, is the one that has that genetic information stored in it, okay? And that's the one read by the, by the RNA polymerase. Don't get caught up on it. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, um, hollow enzymes know exactly where to go. They're specific to DNA sequences, and they only transcribe the genes that they're supposed to. Uh, the, self, the, the sigma subunit recognizes something called the promoter. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll show where the promoter is uh, relative to that gene in a second. So the promoter is just the part of the DNA um, that signals where the gene is and where the start of transcription needs to be. And so what are we looking at here? So this is a decent picture. So you can see here why it's called the sense strand probably in a second. So the template strand is the one being read. That's this one. And so of course we're gonna have complements to all of these. Uh, you know, if it's a G here, it's gonna be a C. If it's an A, it's gonna be a U. Um, but just notice that this first C that was put in here matches this C, right? And then the U of course would be a T, and then the next one's a C, and then a G, and then an A, right? Just going on here. So, so it completely matches this strand up here. Now I'm reading it backwards. I shouldn't be doing that. I was trying to make the comparison just show you guys that um, it does match that other strand. In fact, I probably should have just come over here and said AUG, AUG, right? GCA, GCA. Okay, you get it. That's why it's called the coding strand, but that's not the one that the mRNA uh, is written from. It's the one that matches the mRNA. Okay. Enough of that. Um, okay, so this isn't showing um, the promoter region. Let's find the promoter region here. Here we go. Let me see what I'm skipping. Um, okay, so there's a lot of a lot of DNA that isn't transcribed. We know that um, in ours we have a lot of things called introns that are just sections of within a gene that that aren't meant to be transcribed. Um, but we're just kind of looking at prokaryotes at the moment, they're a lot simpler, and even them, uh, within them, they have a bunch of DNA that doesn't make an actual gene. Now, a lot of those parts of the DNA that don't code for something, uh, they do have a role, and we're figuring out what those roles are. And so one of those roles is to be a promoter region, which is essentially lets the RNA polymerase know where to start. Um, and so that's what's happening here. And so I'm going to show you, sorry, I'm going to show you that picture. Okay, here we go. So again, don't get caught up on, on which strand we're looking at here. Um, when they say something is upstream or when they say something is downstream, then they're always talking about the template strand. Okay, this is always talking about the template strand, even though it's the coding strand that's being shown here. Okay, so these little green highlighted boxes are the actual first position of the genes being transcribed. All of the, uh, the genes are written excuse me, over here on the side. Um, there's uh, a position about 10 
upstream um, here called the, the Prinbo box. And this is common um, within a lot of these, um, these genes. And then further upstream, there's something called the negative 35 region. That's the actual name. And this makes up the promoter. It's these specific regions that the, the RNA polymerase is going to actually find. And you'll notice that there is some differences. Um, and what's being shown underneath these pictures is sort of the, the consensus of like how many different organisms or like what percentage is this first position going to be a T? And what consensus is this going to be an A? And so you kind of see that 96% um, of the time that first uh, code that first um, nucleotide in this first of the negative 10 position is going to be a T. Um, and so a lot of the, re the reason for the heavy ATs here is that those will base pair um, with another A or a T um, and or even a U, right? Um, if it's a, an RNA that's pairing and they only have two hydrogen bonds compared to three. So it's going to be weakly interactive um, and not strongly interactive. And the reason that's important is if you have an RNA polymerase that is strongly interactive with this, um, with this promoter region, it's going to be transcribing this gene more often. If you have one that is, you know, um, too uh, perfectly matched for it, it's going to just bind there and not go anywhere. Um, and so then, you know, having this um, variability within the, the sequence here um, means that your promoter uh, is, is can be stronger or can be weaker for RNA polymerase. Um, and so then RNA polymerase is only transcribing these genes, you know, uh, less often than more often. Anyway, so some of that is important here too. Um, so these are the common, um, just a common sequences or, or a common theme that we see in some of these sequences. There's this region, there's this region. And again, they're just called the negative 10, the negative 35 region. But these are the promoters for a few different bacteria. Now, um, let's talk about closed complex and open complex. So RNA polymerase has to bind to the DNA. And when it binds to the DNA, it has to first form something called a cl closed complex. Um, and that's DNA um, and the RNA and the, um, the mRNA and the sigma factor have to all be there together. And then they have to form an open complex. And I think we have a, a picture of that. Okay, let's, uh, let's use the images to discuss the closed complex and the open complex. Um, we can even talk about the beginning of chain elongation. Uh, so what we're going to discuss is chain initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and use the images. Okay, initiation and long, uh, elongation. So initiation is going to take place uh, first by the promoter region recruiting RNA polymerase and a sigma factor to the scene. Now, um, once these guys form uh, a complex with each other or, or uh, relate to each other, I think the sigma factor um, and the RNA polymerase are, are both spanning the promoter region. Um, when they are all in contact with each other, that's what's called the closed complex. Uh, and this is initiation. Now they have to form the open complex. That's when we get some nucleotides um, basically melting here. This is why those AT rich regions in the DNA um, actually help this process. Those have two hydrogen bonds compared to the three that uh, GCs have. So these promoters should unwind um, pretty easily. So this is the formation of the open complex. Once the open complex has been formed, um, elongation can take place. A few things have to happen. You need to be able to bring in um, the new nucleotides. Uh, there is no, we talked about that there's no need for a primer here. Um, the, uh, let's see, the hollow enzyme uh, elongation of mRNA by about four more nucleotides. I don't know what the difference is showing. Uh, this is other than to say that after a couple of nucleotides get added, the sigma factor falls off. Sigma factor goes and um, binds to you know, another promoter region and helps another RNA polymerase get started. Um, and in bacteria, um, quite often we see the same little stretches of DNA just being 
you know, overrun by, by polymerases. I mean, there's an image. I've seen an image. If this is DNA, there's like, these are all polymerases. It's just like running along. They all have their own mRNAs trailing behind them. Uh, so there are some heavily, you know, um, copied regions. What has to happen here before elongation can really take off is that the promoter uh, is binding really tightly to RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase has to break free from that. And a lot of the time, I think the book says quite often, um, these are abortive transcriptions, meaning that uh, DNA RNA polymerase will just kind of fall off and not do its job after you know having added 10, 15 nucleotides. Um, and that's just because it can't get away from the promoter. So your your book actually has a really nice image of what your uh, of what RNA polymerase uh, has to do. And so I had kind of marked on here. I don't know if you can see it. Let me use a different color. Uh, so here's the R. The, here's the DNA. Did I just pick blue again? Here's the DNA. One strand. This is the template strand. And it's been pulled away. You can see it's been separated here from that pink strand, which is the other strand. Now, um, the RNA polymerase is using that as uh, kind of leverage. It's like kind of like when you pull on a bow and arrow, you pull the bow string, and then you're going to get some, some kind of fling after that. This is going to use um, this energy to f propel itself forward. And that's when chain elongation can really take off. Um, and then we'll talk about how RNA polymerase knows where to stop um, in a second. One of the issues that comes up um, when thinking about how RNA actually moves along the DNA is uh, does it follow the template strand around the double helix or is there some kind of unwinding that's happening similar to a DNA replication? Um, it's the latter, not the former. So this doesn't happen because if the mRNA that's trailing behind this RNA polymerase uh, was really getting kind of tangled up and wrapped around the, the double helix, uh, that would be quite inconvenient. So uh, more realistically, uh, the mRNA probably trails behind the RNA polymerase and there are some topioisomerases that are relieving that, that twisting pressure that's happening. All right, two kinds of termination, though, they involve the same, um, same structure. So um, there's something called intrinsic termination, which doesn't depend on a row protein, um, though it works the exact same way when it does depend on the row protein. Uh, so what happens is mRNA is being transcribed from the DNA. The DNA has encoded in it some inverted repeats. These repeats, when turned into mRNA, form something called a hairpin loop which apparently when the mRNA, I'm sorry, when the RNA polymerase is riding along on the DNA and it forms, you know, this, this hairpin loop inside it somewhere, um, it stalls it, it stalls it, and they can't continue to, to, to move. Um, and this usually leads to the RNA just falling off, uh, RNA polymerase, sorry, falling off of the DNA. Now, in um, row-dependent, there's a row protein, and this row protein actually uh, finds itself um, binding to and chasing the mRNA, uh, the RNA polymerase um, by following this strand of RNA that's being made. Um, and eventually, because this, MR, uh, this RNA polymerase stalls out on the hairpin loop, the row protein is able to catch it and when the rho protein catches the RNA polymerase, uh, that initiates it to terminate um, transcription. So these are the two uh, termination methods. As I mentioned, they both have the hairpin loop involved. Um, so they really are very similar. Why well, I didn't have to draw that at all. So um, what's not shown here is the hairpin loop. So RNA polymerase reaches the, that coded area. And another, another thing, this, um, this termination site usually has a lot of uh, uh, uracils um, being made into the mRNA uh, transcribed. Uh, and so I guess that also weakens the interactions between the RNA polymerase and the DNA itself. Um, 
So those A and Ts that, that tend to be rich in this region um, facilitate the dissociation of the RNA polymerase. So it eventually catches over here and hits the, uh, the uh, I like how it's all tangled around. The mRNA is all wrapped around like a double helix. Um, it eventually catches the RNA polymerase when it encounters that uh, termination site. And then this row protein does something and it falls off. Yeah, let's talk about these guys. So um, let's see, are we going to see some pictures here? Yeah, okay. We're going to go through do these one by one. We're going to talk about some alternative sigma factors. I think your book uses an example using virus, uh, viruses. We'll talk about um, enhancers to the promoter. We'll talk about operons and how these um, control um, sort of regulate genes. And then we'll talk about transcription attenuation. This is a neat one. So alternative sigma factors. So there are some sigma factors um, that are better at, promo at recruiting RNA polymerase than others. And so it would make sense if you had genes that you wanted to be replicated uh, or, or produced all the time to have one sigma factor for them and maybe you know ones that are less important have a diff different sigma factor for those. Um, there is an example of that in E. coli where if they are exposed to high temperatures, then um, a different sigma factor starts to become more active and produce genes that are not typically seen under normal conditions. Um, but a better example is uh, what happens with this virus uh, that infects Bacillus subtilis. So um, the virus infects the, the, the bacteria. It injects its DNA into the bacteria. The bacteria already has a sigma factor. So that sigma factor starts to copy the viral DNA just like it copies its own DNA. One of the first genes or one of the early genes that gets copied inside this um, from the viral DNA is a protein, a new protein, a new sigma factor, and that's GP28. Now GP28 actually starts to recruit the cell's um, own RNA polymerase to a different promoter region. It starts to get it to start to code these middle genes, which start to produce other sigma factors, which have it start to produce, uh, which help it go and find the late genes. And so by the time, you know, by the time this has gone on for uh, a little while, um, there are more viral proteins that are being produced than, than cell proteins, right? Because the virus didn't come in with its own RNA polymerase. It has, though, however, produced a bunch of sigma factors that have basically told the RNA polymerase, you should preferentially, you know, transcribe my viral genes rather than the, tip, the normal bacterial genes. Um, so si sigma factors are, are very influential, influential um, to um, the transcription here. Enhancers. There are regions around the promoter where other proteins can actually bind to. And these, these proteins that bind to regions upstream of the promoter are called transcription factors. They can turn genes on uh, or increase transcription. They can decrease transcription. Um, when they do that, they're called uh, silencers. When they decrease it, when they um, uh, increase uh, the transcription, they're called enhancers. Um, if they turn on a gene or an increased uh, transcription rate of a gene due to um, environmental effects or, or some kind of, um, like in the example I, I gave you a few minutes ago about E. coli, um, when exposed to high heat, start producing a different, um, a different uh, sigma factor that leads to you know, uh, production of different genes. That can be called a response element. But any of these different things that bind, proteins that bind to the DNA and affect transcription are transcription factors. Um, and an example of one is this um, FIS, FIS, uh, the FIS protein. Oops, got my eraser out. Uh, the FIS protein in RNA, um, in RNA polymerase. I'm sorry, not RNA polymerase, ribosomal RNA. So there is a, a, a gene that actually encodes the ribosomes and the, um, the tRNAs and, and all of the, th the other RNAs that exist inside the body. And 
ribosomal RNA actually has three upstream sites um, called FIS sites. There's also, you can see here, this up element. This is just a, a, a position above the, um, or upstream of the promoter. I think my pen is dying. Upstream of the promoter. And they just help get transcription either going faster or slower. The book isn't going into a lot of details about what happens when those proteins bind here. Um, but what we do know is that those proteins will bind here and transcription of this will start. So they are transcription factors. All right. Um, let's talk about what an operon is. Okay, so there are often groups of genes that are related um, with a, a single promoter um, under the control of certain transcription factors. And we can call these um, operators. And so an operon is this whole sort of setup, the, the transcription factor binding spots, the promoter regions, and the actual genes that get transcribed. Those transcribed genes that make proteins are called structural genes within an operon. Um, the operon or the, um, the, the operator binding site does not actually have to be right there next to the gene. Um, they've seen in experiments when they cut out the operon and they move it somewhere else, um, the operon uh, binding you know, sequence, um, the gene is unaffected. The transcription of the gene is unaffected. So it, it, they don't have to be next to each other. Operons, um, or, or the structural gene rather, doesn't actually have to be transcribed all the time. It can be turned off and left off. It can be turned on and left on. We're going to see um, that there's regulation for both of those situations. The example we're going to look at specifically involves um, um, an enzyme for, for digesting lactose. So bacteria will preferentially eat glucose if they can. If there's glucose around, then they don't need to make all the machinery to break down lactose. They just eat gluc glucose. So um, in, the pr in the absence of glucose and in the presence of lactose, there are some genes that get, get turned on or that they get unrepressed. And so we're going to see um, some of those differences. Um, induction is what it's called um, when something either induces uh, a transcription to, um, to turn on. We're going to see that repression um, is what we call it when the gene gets turned off by a repressor or induced by an inducer. So beta-galactosidase, this is the enzyme that can break down um, and get energy from galactose, which is the other sugar um, in lactose. So I probably shouldn't have said lactose. Lactose actually has some glucose in it. And you might, you know, the bacteria can, can eat lactose as long as it has a, an enzyme for breaking down lactose into glucose. But um, if it had to live on galactose, that's a different story. Um, and so this gets coded for. The structural gene is called LAC-Z, and LAC-Z makes beta-galactosidase. Now, there are some other genes on this operon. Here, we can take a look at the operon. So here it is. Um, so we've got uh, a few things. Here's the LAC-Z gene. This one makes um, something permease. It was some kind of, uh, basically this makes it an, an enzyme that allows the cell to take in galactose. Um, and then this one makes a molecule, um, it's, it says it up here, transacetylase. Let's see what it's called. Sorry, I went too far. Lost it. Uh, yeah, transacetylase. Um, it's unsure what exactly that does. They think it might have something to do with disabling antibiotics that can come in through lactose permease. Um, okay, so let's go back to the picture. So this is the operon. The operon, or the um, operator binding site, So I don't have a pen anymore. So this is the operator binding site. 
And what you can see here is that there's a repressor bound to it. And we'll talk about repressors in a second. Um, this is the promoter region right here. So even if RNA polymerase could bind there, it wouldn't be able to pass the repressor bound to the operon. And that repressor that's actually bound there is transcribed by this gene, LAC I. Um, and so you can see that this gene is normally turned off, right? Because nothing is repressing the formation or the production of lac I. So that, that thing exists. It exists and then blocks the rest of this process. So that's just kind of showing you where everything is. So um, the expression of these genes, these structural genes, are um, under the regulation of uh, a repressor protein. And that repressor protein would then be called uh, a regulatory gene. It's a regulatory gene because it makes a protein that represses this whole process. The regulatory gene I mentioned can be far from the operon. And the repressor is just that, um, that molecule that we saw binding to the, um, the operator position. So this is talking a little bit about um, just that repressor protein, uh, that it's a tetramer. So the operator is the, the binding site, the, the element of the DNA that the repressor finds. So when you say that an operon is under the control of an operator, um, that operator can either be an activator or it could be in a repressor. In this case, we have a repressor. The operator and the promoter together are called the control site. So here we can see um, actually what happens um, with an inducer. So an inducer is just something that can turn a gene on. Now it can induce a gene a few different ways. This one is actually inducing this negative uh, control to become more of a positive, uh, well not, it's not changing the way, it's not changing the control. It's inducing the negative troll, controlled uh, gene to now be transcribed. It's a negative controlled gene because without doing anything, this gene is just off, okay? Um, there are some genes that are just on. So this one's off. The inducer triggers the repressor to be unable to bind at the operator. So this repressor, under normal circumstances, would go and bind at the operator. Now, in the presence of an inducer, we get some binding of that enzyme or of that protein, probably some kind of allosteric, uh, you know, um, shape changing happening here. And now this repressor can no longer bind at that operator. And so now uh, RNA polymerase will be recruited to that, <coughs> excuse me, to that promoter region, and it'll be allowed to transcribe these genes. So there are a few different um, method, methods of um, control, and I think we're going to look at a few of those. So the lac operon is induced when lactose is there and there is, is no glucose. Glucose is actually one of the repressors, and, and it does it in a, in a certain way, uh, through catabolite repression. So what happens is... Um, well, this, this is going to tell us. So there's uh, another molecule that gets made um, that's called the catabolic activator protein, or CAP. Okay? CAP will form a complex with cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP levels fluctuate depending on whether or not we have glucose or, or not in our bodies. Um, when we start to get low in glucose, let's see, where is our... So when we're low in glucose, um, the cyclic AMP levels are higher. And so these are going to form a complex with CAP to go and bind at that um, operator and actually enhance the job of RNA polymerase to, again, start making um, all of the genes that we need to um, turn on this, um, this lact galactose utilizing proteins. Um, if glucose is present, 
then cyclic AMP is going to be low. And cyclic AMP then isn't going to be binding to CAP. And CAP uh, cyclic AMP aren't going to be going and turning on um, RNA polymerase and, and increasing that sort of um, production. So cyclic AMP is formed when you don't have any glucose present. It's like the hunger, the hunger alarm that, that goes off, the chemical uh, signal that says, you know, we don't have any glucose. Um, so it's neat that that, you know, coupled with the presence of, um, you know, galactose, because remember, galactose being present is going to go and disable our repressor so that it can go and, and do the job that it's supposed to do. Right? If we go back here, actually, this didn't tell us what the what the repressor or what the inducer was, um, but you would imagine that the inducer for the turn on this system uh, would actually be the molecule that uh, you want to break down. So I would imagine that galactose is actually the thing here that's the inducer that would turn off this repressor system. Uh, anyways, it's neat that, that the presence of galactose turns on that gene but then also the signal and the, the presence of cyclic AMP goes to help re recruit this cap protein to again recruit RNA polymerase to do the job. Okay, uh, basic control mechanisms. Let's look at negative control and positive control and then look at how induction and repression sort of work with that. Um, so negative control is a gene that's, that's um, going to be off unless we do something. And so that's an example of uh, this corner right here. This is an example of the repressor we just saw with the lac operon. So uh, the lactose genes are turned off because this uh, gene product here is repressing them. Now, um, a gene that's always on might be like this corner down here. So this one has an inducer that's a, a gene product that comes in here and just turns this gene on and has, has it staying on. Now, um, to turn off those, uh, or to, so I guess to induce the negative gene to become on and to induce, so induction, uh, to turn the negative gene on and to turn the positive gene off, I guess. We can't talk about induction in both cases because they, they would mean different things. So we, were, we have to induce our negative control one because it's off, we want to turn it on. Uh, we have to repress our positive control one because it's on and we want to turn it off. And these are done with some kind of co-inducer, co-repressor. Uh, co so the co-inducer, um, I don't know why it's called a co-inducer and it isn't just called an inducer, um, is like galactose in our example with, with this, this um, lactose operon. This will come and bind with that reg um, with that repressor protein and actually take it off of the promoter region so that synthesis can happen. And then um, this one here uh, down in the bottom corner is actually kind of like the cyclic AMP one. We've got this active inducer. Um, oh no, no. The cyclic AMP example is more like, more like this one uh, where we have this inactive inducer, this cap protein. And only in the presence of cyclic AMP will these guys activate to turn on this gene. So then what's a good example of this? Um, maybe we didn't look at one. Hold on. Uh, let's go over to the repression real quick. So here we've got an inactive repressor that isn't repressing anything until a co-repressor comes around. Um, I don't know if we have, if we talked about an example of those. Let's see. No, we don't have any, a particular example to use for these. So we do. We did have an example uh, for this one with the lactose operon. We did have an example of this one with the lactose operon. But these other two, we don't have examples that we've looked at. But that's okay. We can still understand the concept here. This one is just the opposite of, you know, the negative induction, negative control uh, with induction. And uh, this bottom left one is just the opposite of the positive control with induction. OK.
sorry. So if you have any questions, uh, post them in the uh, in the discussion board. Okay, so these are the, the control mechanisms. All right, so this one is actually um, transcription attenuation. So that's what we're going to talk about here. And so this, this is an operon for the production of tryptophan. So this thing makes tryptophan. And you can see here, there's, there's a lot going on, right? Um, there's, there's some structural genes here. There's five structural genes. They code for four different proteins. Um, e and D both code for two different, protein, uh, two different parts of one protein. Um, C, trypt C actually makes two different proteins. I'm unsure how that exactly is possible. And then uh, B and A also make two subunits of a protein. And then you can see that these guys all have their roles um, in the enzymatic transformation be uh, of chlorisomate into tryptophan. Okay, so this makes tryptophan. Now, what you'll notice is that this has uh, some control sites here. There's the um, promoter and the operator region. And then we have this, um, what they call, uh, what your book called, what did your book call it? Your book called it a leading, a leading strand. It makes this weird little part that they adds to all the proteins there. And, but what's important here is that there's a spot in here that codes for tryptophans. And so down the line, right, this is gonna be turned into mRNA and then mRNA is gonna go into protein. So this is gonna have uh, the mRNA incorporate some tryptophan. And so if tryptophan is in low supply, what'll happen is that this gene transcription will happen normally and it'll make more tryptophan, as you would expect if you had low supply. If tryptophan though is in high amounts, something will actually happen with the tryptophans once they get incorporated into that mRNA. They form this weird little, uh, well, let's see if I have a picture of it. They form a few different structures. They can either form one, two pause structure, three, four terminator structure, or two, three anti-terminator structure, and these are them. When tryptophan is high, when tryptophan levels are high, this ribosome goes fast. The fast pace of the ribosome actually prevents the anti-terminator sequence from happening. It allows the terminator sequence to form, which ends up dropping RNA polymerase off of the DNA. The, D, the, the RNA polymerase first initially pauses when the, one of the hairpin loops form, when the one-two pause structure forms. Um, but then, the, the, again, the speed of the ribosome leads to the formation of the 3,4 terminator. In low tryptophan, because that ribosome was unable to incorporate a couple of tryptophans um, early on in the sequence, it does allow this anti-terminator form to, to, to form, um, which doesn't end up kicking off the, uh, the RNA polymerase. And this is actually the setup in a lot of different um, enzymatic uh, reactions or a lot of different operons um, for those amino acids, uh, where the amino acid itself will, will, will be incorporated into a leader strand um, that determines whether or not, you know, um, one of these structures will form and an RNA polymerase will either fall off or not fall off. Uh, we'll just look at briefly some of the similarities. Okay. So one of the main differences is that uh, where in prokaryotes there's one RNA polymerase, we have a whole bunch. And they found um, at least four different RNA polymerases. Um, I think there's a table that's gonna summarize a few of these. Um, actually, I think there's three and they're all right here. Um, polymerase two is the main one that synthesizes uh, the mRNA that we're interested in. Polymerase one and polymerase three um, have a role in, in not, um, I think one, polymerase one makes some of the R ribosomal RNA, but not all of it. The rest is made by three and maybe others. Um, RNA three um, is responsible for, for synthesizing the tRNAs. We'll look at, um, at some of those, or we looked at some of those, I mean, uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so that's one of the differences is that we have a couple of these RNA polymerases. 
Um, let's see. These are the subunits, so there's quite a few proteins actually involved um, in, in putting together these different polymerases, and you can see that um, some of them are involved in recognizing promoter, some involved in helping everything assemble, some that are uh, in all of the different polymerases. Um, polymerase 2 here, different subunits all colored, uh, colored differently. Here it's actually bound to the DNA, and you can see a little piece of RNA coming out. It's kind of cool. Um, just like in the prokaryotes, there are um, operator regions, promoter regions, and um, upstream elements. Uh, the Tata box here is slightly different from the negative 10 box that we saw, but again, these are just places that will be recognized by um, transcription factors. Um, one of the other differences is uh, rather than having the sigma unit um, or the sigma, uh, sigma factor, um, prokaryotes um, are much less complicated. Eukaryotes have multiple transcription factors. Anything that helps bind um, and start transcription that isn't a protein involved in the core of the polymerase is, is essentially a transcription factor. Um, you're going to see a, quite a few listed here, but these are the regions that they recognize. Um, we can skip the details of this. Again, uh, we looked at the initiation, elongation, and termination of prokaryotes. If you can get that down, I'll be happy. These are some of those transcription factors and some of the jobs that they have or that they are uh, associated with. And again, transcription in eukaryotes. Uh, okay. All right, regulation of gene expression. So similar in prokaryotes, there are um, activators and repressors, or in this case, enhancers and silencers. Um, that can bind to regions of the DNA and um, well in prokaryotes they, they blocked the polymerase from actually um, being able to, to move down um, or at least that's the, the examples that we looked at were proteins that were bound to the DNA and blocking the promoter region from the RNA polymerase. In this case the regions um, that actually do the um, uh, regulating don't have to be anywhere near uh, the actual promoter region, they can be upstream quite a distance, and there are these mediator proteins um, that act as a, as a bridge between the two. And so what will happen in the enhancer case is that a co-activator will come in and actually bind to, the, um, to this enhancer region of the DNA, and then um, this mediator will come in, the tail portion will bind to that, the head portion will bind to the promoter, assuming that this co-activator is sending the right signal to the mediator and then RNA polymerase and all the, the transcription factors will come and bind on there uh, and then transcription will take place. In the silencer situation, a co-repressor would bind to the silencer region and um, it, from the diagram here it looks like there are some other um, uh, mediator proteins that seem to be involved in changing the shape of that mediator protein so that it no longer um, has the right orientation to interact with the promoter and so then RNA polymerase and the transcription factors will not be uh, binding to the promoter and we won't see transcription. So um, that's, that's the way regulation uh, can take place with enhancers and silencers. Now um, another big difference is that uh, eukaryotic DNAs associated with proteins. It's wrapped up um, in those um, nucleosomes with all the histone proteins. And so one of the, the main regulatory ways of keeping transcription under control is by not allowing the promoter regions to become available so that um, you know anything can bind to it. Um, and so we're going to look at uh, two methods essentially of um, uh, regulation through that method. So, um, 
chromatin remodeling complexes. Uh, we'll look at that one first. This one costs energy and it changes the structure of the nucleosomes um, so that the different chromosomes kind of um, different stretches of DNA become available. Uh, actually, let's just look at the picture. So different proteins come in here. Um, this, this protein complex binds to the, the chromosome or the chromatin, ATP, energy, um, and then we get some stretches of, of DNA. It looks like uh, the book is still unsure exactly what happens in this whole process. Um, and then they call it remodeling. There's a few different methods of remodeling. Two were shown here, octamer transfers, octamer sliding, um, where I guess this little protein is going to travel along this band and then reveal different pieces of, of different stretches of, of the DNA. Um, an animation would probably serve better for this kind of thing, but um, that's one method. And then the other is the actual, uh, more of a zoomed in kind of picture, um, histone modifying enzymes, so let's take a look at those. So this is a real close up of um, one of the um, histone uh, cores with DNA wrapped around it. And uh, all the different histones, remember, different subunits are all made up of different proteins. So they all have um, N termini. So these are their, their, their ending, right? The, the N terminus is where the first number one amino acids, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, anyways, various methods of um, acetylation, methylations, um, phosphorylations, um, a bunch of these different things. So um, acetylations of lysines and arginines. I'm sorry, acetylation of lysine, uh, methylation of uh, arginine and lysine. And then it um, looks like phosphorylation of sulfurs. Um, these are the different events that cause changes within this um, histone protein. Um, mainly they're, they're charge related. So if you remember DNA has that phosphate backbone it's highly negatively charged, and these arginines and these um, and these lysines are basic. They're positively charged, and that helps with that association between the histones and the DNA. Um, so by going in and acetylating and methylating these, uh, it removes those charges, and so then the association between DNA and the histone uh, becomes weaker. DNA is able to move or turn or you know. Uh, adjust in a way that the transcription um, factors and the RNA polymerase can now uh, bind to them. So that's the other regulatory method. And this is kind of showing that. So there is a couple of these um, proteins in this SWI, SNF family that are involved in the, the, the moving around of the chromatin and um, this as well this is a, um, a histone acetyl acetyl transferase it's uh, actually doing the uh, the job of I guess in the picture we just looked at um, adding the acetyl groups and changing the charges on those um, and so what we're just seeing here in this graphic is that when it's when the system is turned on and the gene transcription is, is desired uh, we have open chromatin, we have unmethylated cysteines, uh, cytosines, sorry, and um, so in the, in the DNA backbone, and then acet acetylated histones. And then when this is not the case, um, then the chromatin is condensed, so you can see there isn't uh, any, any transcription happening, it's real packed in. Uh, methylated cytosines as opposed to unmethylated. Um, so, so methylating the cytosines um, has some effect on uh, making the DNA in this, these little stretches available. And then the deacetylated histones. Uh, I don't remember what HDAC and HMT were again. I'll have to go back and look at that. But. Response elements are enhancers that respond to certain metabolic factors. Uh, our bodies um, have, a, have multiple response factor, or response elements. Heat shock element, glutocorticoid response element, metal response element, cyclic AMP response element. Um, this one is, is similar to the cyclic AMP one we looked at a little bit earlier. Um, 
cyclic AMP gets triggered or gets um, uh, produced essentially when we, we don't have any glucose. Um, it's kind of like the signal that tells your body, hey, we need to start breaking things down to make energy. Um, so what happens, uh, actually specifically, we're going to look at um, um, the response effect of, of, of this particular uh, response element. Um, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so in this one, when the presence of cyclic AMP, um, well, well, let's talk about the case where, where it's not present first. So case A here. So we've got this um, transcription factor um, that would normally bind to this enhancer region of a gene. Now, um, now that, just to be clear, every, every gene gets transcribed at some base level. And then there are enhancers that can bring that up to, you know, a hundred times base level. So, so with this saying right here that there's no transcription is we're talking about no enhanced transcription. There's still going to be some transcription factors, normal transcription factors that are going to recognize this protein and make whatever it is. Um, but in this case, we're, we're talking about the enhancing action of this. So when um, this is present, but there isn't um, uh, cyclic AMP, then this isn't turned on and so nothing is happening. When cyclic AMP is around, what that does is it interacts with um, these cyclic AMP dependent um, uh, kinases that be, go and phosphorylate things, and the Kreb gets phosphorylated. So that's, that's kind of shown here with this um, when it's phosphorylated, it actually binds to uh, the Krebs binding pro protein, CBP. Um, and that allows it to, uh, with a mediator, um, form that little bridge to the promoter and recruit DNA or RNA polymerase to come in here and transcribe this gene. So, yeah, that's one of the response elements. Uh, presence of glucocorticoids triggers this one. Heat shock, presence of cadmium. Uh, yeah, okay. There's actually a few ways um, that Kreb is involved. Kreb and CBP um, and gene activation. It can be activated the way that we just looked at. Uh, CBB, CBP can be activated by nuclear receptors. Um, and then separate pathways can lead to um, and then associate with that to form uh, or to start to transcribe a gene more more aggressively. There's a lot of abbreviations for transcription. Don't worry about about memorizing these or anything. I'm not going to I don't use them. I probably won't use them on the test. Non-coding RNAs. So um, 98% of the RNAs produced from your DNA seem to be non-coding. Um, they're not things that get turned into a protein. So um, they are linked to gene silencing. Uh, well, there's some RNA processing, RNA modification, translation, protein stabilization, protein translocation. Um, quite a lot of... Uh, of other things. Uh, microRNAs. We're going to look at how microRNAs and small interfering RNAs actually um, might be beneficial, especially um, in early life or in, in small um, like bacteria um, that are more susceptible to you know viral infections uh, because they don't have protective barriers like like we do. Um, but then you know evolutionarily we may have um, benefited from this as well. So um, let's take a look at those two um, microRNAs and um, uh, the interfering, small interfering. Um, so this is a diagram showing essentially two pathways. Um, one, let's say that you get some double-stranded RNA injected into you, whether that's from a virus or it's uh, a doctor does it. Um, or if there are some pre-MR microRNAs that uh, find their way um, kind of left over 
from transcription and stuff like that. These hairpin loops are really common structures towards the end of uh, transcription. Um, and so then there's these dicer proteins that'll actually uh, come in here and kind of chop these up a little bit. Um, and then we get these, you know, double-stranded little pieces. Um, and then this, this RISC protein comes in here. And actually its job is to unwind this whole, this whole setup and get rid of the sense strand. It keeps the antisense strand. And it keeps the antisense strand because that one is going to be a complement to any mRNAs that are out there. And so this is like a defense mechanism. Some new DNA got introduced to your cell. Most likely, polymerases that you have are going to go in there and start copying it. And, and RNA polymerase, especially, is going to start copying it and making the genes that it codes for. And you want to stop that. Your body wants to stop that. So it finds those DNAs, it cuts them up, and it takes something it knows is going to be a match for those mRNAs. Um, and so in one of these branches, when it actually comes from um, the mRNA, uh, or comes from the actual DNA that made the mRNA, it's going to be a perfect match. And so it's going to go out there, this sense strand, or sorry, anti-sense strand, and it'll actually find that spot on the mRNA that's floating around and it'll bind to it, and um, a different protein comes in here and cleaves it all up, and so it doesn't get transcribed. In the other, in the other situation, this is just kind of random GNA, DNA, uh, random um, RNA segments, and so these just kind of float around, um, but they are going to pair up with um, pieces of some RNAs, some mRNAs, and so those they'll find they'll do some imperfect binding. Um, they don't get chewed up, but the polymerase can't exactly uh, transcribe on them. And so, again, transcription is blocked. And so it's thought that, um, you know, I mean, in the beginning, before there was proteins, RNA was the thing running around, catalyzing everything and storing all the genetic information, and it had to protect itself. And so these mechanisms um, are probably left over, right, this RNA interference is left over from when RNA had to be protecting the DNA. Um, so it's it's pretty neat how how these work. So let's just briefly talk about the structural motifs that we see. Um, proteins and transcription factors that bind directly to DNA tend to have a lot of these uh, common mo motifs. Um, helix turn helix, zinc fingers, um, basic region, so having lots of uh, basic amino acid, leucine zippers. Um, yeah. And so these are found on the transcription activation domains. So parts of the transcription factor that actually um, interact with the DNA. All right, so um, helix turn helix. These, um, these have a group of alpha helix that fits into the major group on the on the DNA strand. Um, most helix turn helixes have a pretty conserved sequence of about 20 amino acids. That conserved meaning that they, uh, from organism to organism, they stay pretty much the same sequence. Um, let's see, what else here? They tend to bind more into the major groove um, if there's a DNA specific sequence uh, and that has to do with the space of the major groove It's a little less crowded and so um, it's a little it's a little easier to identify the differences between the bases um, And that's what it's saying um, here is that there's more of a unique structure uh, That the the protein can recognize This is showing um, some of those interactions uh, glutamine and adenine um, can hydrogen bond and arginine and guanine can um, hydrogen bond. And so this is some of the way that those um, base pairs can actually interact with the amino acid residues. Zinc fingers, we see this um, in polymerase three, or part of uh, one of the transcription factors rather that associates with polymerase three. Um, nine repeating structures of 30 amino acids each there are two cysteines and two histidines based 12 amino acids apart. 
uh, or spaced after 12 amino acids. I think they're actually spaced seven amino acids apart. I have to check the, the book on that exact number. Um, they're called zinc fingers because of the little uh, bulge that happens between the two cysteines. So here's one finger, two fingers, three fingers. Basic region leucine zipper motif. Um, it's called a zipper because of the way that it looks when um, the two kind of halves of these. Um, um, oh, this is the one with the seven residue spacing. All right, I, I misspoke. Um, so half of this protein is composed with a basic region. Um, the second half contains a series of leucines every seven residues. Um, when that happens, it forms a really neat structure. This thing is kind of spinning, and so this is that little kind of pocket there. When two of these are near each other, they kind of inter intertwine with each other like a zipper. Um, so then it's kind of thought, it's kind of got its name from that. There are acidic domains. Um, so what this is talking about is what we were looking at just now is DNA interacting with the protein. Um, but there are some um, interactions um, between proteins that don't actually touch DNA. And so some of those like transcription, transcription factors that are inter interacting with like, let's say DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase. Um, these are just protein-protein interactions, so these are the ones that are described here. Um, there are acidic domains, there are glutamine-rich domains, there are proline-rich domains. Post-transcriptional RNA modification, so this talks about things that are done after the, the, the mRNA or the tRNA or the rRNA uh, or the RNA in general has been synthesized or transcribed, um, alterations to the structure to make it into its either final form or into its active form. Um, so for eukaryotes, a lot for our mRNA is different because we have introns that get encoded and have to be cut out. Um, also, we, we get modifications to the beginning and the end of the sequence. Um, so that's kind of mentioned here. Addition of the terminal sequence, um, modification of the structure of specific bases. So in tRNA, we're going to see some of that. So let's kind of just jump in. Um, so tRNA here, often uh, multiple tRNAs are encoded into one big long stretch of, uh, of, of you know, gene. Um, and so this one actually encodes for two tRNAs here. There's one here and one there. And so one of the first things that happens is this gets cut off. Um, and then a new end here is going to get added on, this ACC. Um, and then there's going to be some endonuclease activity. There's going to be some cuts. And then in this direction, this w which will be a proline, gets modified. Um, it gets a uracil trimmed off, it looks like. And then um, it gets something added on. A CA added on to the end, and then over here, this one that's going to be a serine. Anyways, so there's some post-transcriptional modifications. We don't need to know the details of, of how these all turn into their final um, tRNAs, but we're just seeing, hey, there's, there's a lot of chopping up and adding on that goes into this particular um, RNA, um, tRNA section or tRNA molecule. Um, a pretty common um, uh, modification is a methyl or methylation of this particular oxygen on the um, on the um, RNAs. Uh, let's see. And a typical substitution is a sulfur for where oxygens are. Okay. Ribosomal RNA. Um, most of the ribosomal differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes are, are just in their sizes uh, and the number of subunits they have. And so then depending on which subunit it is, um, these all get cut to the right size. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Um, and so yeah, this is, uh, um, so there's some cutting and trimming that goes down with the RNAs. 
and then um, base modifications, um, usually methylations, um, are also a common thing. Um, mRNA, we already said splicing was important. Uh, the the, um, the uh, introns have to get cut out, and we're going to look at that in a second. Um, end capping happens. So um, the five prime end gets this big long sort of cap on it. Actually, this is the cap. And then these two bases get, uh, these sugar bases get um, uh, methylated for some reason. Um, there's, uh, so this is the mRNA, the, the cap on the five prime end. And then a three prime end gets this polyadenylate tail. So about 100 to 200 nucleotides gets added to the end. Uh, it's supposed to protect or thought to protect the mRNA from nucleases and phosphatases that would otherwise degrade it. Um, our exons are coding, our introns are not coding, but they divide up our coding genes, and so those get cut out. And uh, here's an example of a bunch of introns in this gene. So those get copied into the mRNA, and so they need to be spliced out. Um, and then piece, all the exons need to be pieced together. And so some of the ways that this happens, um, we're going to see here in a second. So this takes place in the nucleus, requires cleaving the five prime and three prime ends of all the introns and joining the other ends together. Um, there are specific sequences at the splice sites, and then there's a branch site that you'll see has a very conserved sequence, one that never changes. It's always the same. Um, so there are also small nucleo, ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs, that do the job. And we're going to see this lariat that forms. So here is um, it's going to be a nucleophilic attack by this G right here. Um, this thing is going to fold over, and that G is going to attack the A in the branch site. And so a bond forms here. That gets snipped off. And then this G right here is going to do the same thing over here and uh, attack that snip and get snipped off. And so this is the lariat right there. Your book goes into a lot more uh, detail. Um, so some genes are actually, uh, some, some, some expression can actually be controlled after the mRNA has already been um, uh, transcribed. And this means uh, essentially um, that it's a splicing that determines the, the actual protein you get. So um, different exons could be pieced together in different ways, essentially. And so we do have uh, proteins in our bodies that, that have different isoforms, meaning that they're made from the same gene, but they are different in the way that their exons were put together. Um, this could lead to two different, or come from two different possibilities, either um, two different mRNAs um, for the same, you know, from the same gene, or it's the same mRNA, but in one um, tissue, it, it does one protein, and then in a different tissue, because of whatever uh, environmental factors in that, in that particular tissue, modifications happen that lead to a different protein. Um, so so th those are things that can happen, isoforms. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about isoforms. Your book talks about... Um, I think it talked about some kind of muscle cells that we have, that there are, there are, there's one gene that has up to like 18 something different actual gene products that it can make. Um, but I remember thinking that that's, it's similar to our immune system also, in that uh, we have these genes that can be randomly spliced together in different ways to promote, you know, new antibodies that have never been made before that could possibly go and track down a, a foreign um, invader. Um, okay, so alternative RNA splicing, and then lastly, 
uh, ribozymes. Ribozymes are um, RNA molecules that have um, catalytic activity. So some of these are self-splicing. Um, we, we know uh, from the beginning of this book that um, RNA had catalytic catalytic um, abilities earlier on um, and then kind of offloaded that job to proteins. So some some protein and uh, RNA associations still still use the RNA portion as a catalyst and um, there was there was some molecule that that we talked about and I remember pointing out that since it was the RNA portion of the molecule that actually does the catalyzing of whatever it was that we were talking about that that's what makes it a ribozyme. Um, but anyways, okay, so um, I think that kind of wraps up this chapter. Um, again, don't focus too much on the, the differences and the, uh, the different details from the eukaryotic transcription from, uh, from prokaryotic. Um, just, you know, the, the differences that we're worried about are that there are way more transcription factors and that there isn't the sigma factor and that, you know, the DNA is associated with histones, again, major differences um, everything is different if you start to look at the, the actual differences right um, so so that's not the important stuff um, but know the general um, trend for how the DNA uh, gets gets available for copying and gets copied and um, what each of the, the the regions are essentially doing you know promoter and up upstream elements how they just enhance um, you know or or repress um, those the ability for the RNA polymerase to go and actually do that job of transcription. Um, so just kind of know generally what those things do um, and how it's regulated, how the different regulation um, kind of mechanisms um, work. And um, if you have any questions,